gone forward with Stewart to the right. Lineker and Howes to the left. Is Gascoigne going to have a crack? He is, you know. Oh, I think! Brilliant! That is schoolboy's own stuff. Oh, I bet even he can't believe it. Is there anything left from this man to surprise us? That was one of the finest free kicks that this stadium has ever seen. Hello and welcome to Hitting the Bar, the football podcast, episode 75. I'm Chris Carl. And I'm Jeff Saunders. Before we talk about uh, all the news in football, including Aguero leaving Man City and the excitement of watching England in international action, your trivia question. What have Matt Sadler, Frank Gill, Mark Robbins, Wayne Gill and Ishmael Miller all got in common? Mm, interesting. Right, let's get started. The news broke, I think it was yesterday, that Manchester City all-time top scorer Aguero uh, is leaving Man City at the end of this season. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a great surprise. I think if, if they'd wanted him to stay, we'd have heard about it before now. They'd have done the deal. His goals per per game have dropped considerably, but he hasn't played that much, and that's probably the reason. He does seem to be getting injured more than before, and then maybe it's just, just the right time. Yeah, as you say, I mean, the lad is 32, which I suppose, for a striker, is heading to the end of a career. As we say, top scorer, but He's made, I think, 14 appearances, nine not off the bench this season and just a one, just three goals. So I suppose he has dropped off a bit. But he's made a hell of an impression on the Premier League over those 10 years. Well, well he has. I mean, potentially he's, he's, he's in there in the argument for the best foreign player to play in the Premier League. And who can forget 2012 in May for that goal? Four minutes into Fergie time. Fergie didn't didn't enjoy that extra time added on, did he? But what an absolutely fantastic thing. It, it's changed the, the fortunes of that club. I do remember watching that game, and of course, Man United fans in the bar where I was, their game had finished, uh, and they thought they'd won the league. And then they're watching the extra two or three minutes with City, and he goes and scores in, as you say, extra time. It was quite a moment in Premier League history, really. They are saying at Man City they're going to build a statue in his honour and put it alongside their statues of Vincent company and David Silva. Yeah, I, I think because of what he he did and the effect it had on Manchester City and the fact that he is there by a long way, the leading goal scorer, he's got one of the records in, in the Premier League for goals per minute played. Yeah, he, he's a player that deserves a statue. The other two, I'm not, not really convinced about. Should you get a statue just for playing playing well, playing good foot, you know, being a good footballer? Is that enough to earn you a statue? Surely, surely it should be for, you know, the people like Bobby Charlton, George Best, people who changed the the course of their club and Aguero definitely did that he deserves a statue I'd question the other two to be honest yeah this whole thing about statues I mean they'll end up with loads of them I mean we've got I think four statues at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium um, but we prefer to call them our starting 11 defence <laughs> however if you were to pick apart from Bobby Moore one person for West Ham who would I mean I would I would like to have Gaza outside Tottenham for example who would you have Oh, it, it would have to be Jeff Hurst wouldn't it Was that, we used to call it a golden hat trick in those days where you score with your head, left foot and right foot. But to do that in a World Cup final as well, that's no, it's got to be Jeff Hurst. Yes, they now call that a perfect hat-trick, don't they? Yeah. All right, if we're going to talk about Aguero, and you said one of the best ever foreign players... Tio Henry is up there, I suppose. Who else would you put in competition against Aguero? I'd put Emil Zola at Chelsea. Um, for, the, for the same reason, I think Aguero deserves deserves a statue. He changed the course of, of Chelsea and how they were perceived by other people. And the most incredibly talented footballer. I, I saw them in the, the Cup Winners' Cup final back when that existed in Stockholm. And, and his goal there was just unbelievable. There was nothing on. He could not score and did and he used to do that regularly so I think Thierry Henry yeah you, you can't argue with his numbers he he should be up there in the discussion I don't like Wanderers or Wanderers players but the, the numbers don't lie do they but someone like Zola who the impact he had on a club and changed its direction and the fact that he was just the most incredibly talented player I've seen apart from uh, Lionel Messi yeah I think there's a, a few players over the course of just the Premier League even that would get a shout and unfortunately quite a few of them 
because most of the starting 11 were foreign players from that Woolwich Wanderers team of that era. A few of those would have a shout, I suppose. Oh, that's Sergio, that's Sergio Aguero uh, leaving Manchester City. Where do you think he'll go? Oh, I, I really don't know. I, I, the issue that everybody is going to have and, and that he will have is his injury record in the last two years. Subject to how well he's feeling and how fit he is, I think that will determine whether he goes to the route of America or another European league. Yeah, I, I, I mean, there was talk, would he go to um, Barcelona if Messi leaves? But I, don't, I think those days have gone in his career. I think his legs have gone. I think he's going to be playing out his career for money somewhere, China, America, more as a novelty rather than somebody who's still chasing trophies. Yeah, I think so. I mean, your, your comment about his legs going is, is a, a big part of the reason. He can't do the very fast, high pressing anymore because you know, he just doesn't have the, the legs or the stamina anymore. But in, in a league where somebody wants a goal poacher, someone who will score goals, he'll still do very well. All right, let's leave brilliant footballers and fast, high pressing behind and talk about England. <laughs> you and I watched England against Albania together, but um, separately we watched England against San Marino. A standard, bog standard, 5-0 win. Jesse Lingard, who you said shouldn't be in the squad, actually was voted man of the match, but probably because he had something to prove and he tried harder than everybody else. Yeah, he, he, he should not have been in the squad and playing against a team. We beat the team 5-0, whose average result over all the internationals they played is a 5-0 loss. So we, we were spectacularly average. Looking good against Albania, if you're a Premier League footballer, well quite frankly you should shouldn't you San Marino are bottom of the FIFA pile rankings it's a country with 33,000 inhabitants and another 3,000 who live abroad so there's not a lot to pick from for them most of them were semi-professional the cliched postman and uh, and teacher that you get in these that you used to get at least in these squads but they put up a, they put up a little bit of a fight at least their goalkeeper did saved some spectacular shots seven of them seven of them from Lingard he wasn't happy about that but he'll have done himself no harm no, he'll probably get a move to a second division Italian team. The thing which puzzles me about San Marino is why don't they poach Italian players who can't get in the, Ita- in the Italian national team? There, there must be plenty of those in, in Serie A that they could say, you know, do, do what Jack Charlton did for Ireland. You know, get your Tony Cascarinos of, uh, of Serie A into, into your San Marino team. Why don't they do that? Well, yeah, I looked up San, uh, San Marino. To have a look, you know, find out a little bit about the country, and of course, as we know, it is it's it's an enclave surrounded by Italy, and they are. You mentioned, by the way, that um, despite the fact that they are surrounded by Italy, they're not in the EU, but they actually use the euro. Would you believe the actual wealth of the country is on a par with Italy, you know, per capita? So they've got the money. It's not a poor country. They could kind of, I suppose, yeah, in, encourage or entice players who'll never get in in other national teams to come along and, and play for them, and probably. Get Get decent tax breaks. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure of tax breaks because I don't know how it how it kind of works in there. Probably it, it might be that they all pay Italian taxes anyway. I don't know, but it, it's an obvious thing for them to do, and I'm surprised no one's done it. Yeah, the other thing uh, watching that game and. The entire game was played in San Marino's half. I think they had one shot, I think, but apart from one or two occasions, the entire game, 85% of possession to England, all that, played in San Marino's half. Being a San Marino player must be awful. I mean, they've lost, I don't know what it is, 120 out of 122 internationals. And when they get called up, they must feel absolutely miserable. Yeah, I, I don't quite understand. Well, I, I, I don't know how those players must feel. I, I'm not sure that they can have the same sort of patriotic feeling either, because it's drive through it and there's nothing to say you've actually gone into a different country or anything you know just the road carries on and you follow the road so yeah um, England were sort of average against a very very poor team as usual there was nothing to learn from that game I mean everybody did their job I think they enjoyed playing it they could see some smiles on faces Raheem Sterling was desperate to score Lingard was desperate to score Nick Pope had nothing to do absolutely nothing to do in goal then they played Albania and I think the only time Nick Pope actually touched the ball in that game he made a terrible mistake well, about four or five times he 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 did his his distribution, his kicking from 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 ground was very very poor. It was as if the ball bobbled every single time he went to kick it, and it wasn't wasn't good at all. Um, he's still the best goalkeeper, best English goalkeeper, but he will almost certainly be replaced by Southgate because Southgate loves Pickford for reasons which pass all understanding. Same situation as Maguire. What on earth is Maguire doing in an England squad for for one and a half seasons now? He has been terrible, absolutely terrible. Not just not as good as average he's been really really poor but you know it it seems if you're a Manchester United player you get picked yeah I have to say there was a a few 
choices that Southgate made that surprised me. In the San Marino game, obviously he could play around and you know didn't have to pick Harry Kane, whose goal against Albania was brilliant. But Harry Maguire has not made a case to be in the squad. There's Connor Cody, who's actually Wolves' captain, so he's a man of experience, and obviously you need somebody who's got a bit of guts about them. And if he's if he's if he's the captain of the team, then you know you can trust him there. Maguire is picked ahead of him, and I think it's shocking. Cody is is light years ahead of Maguire. Uh, so are me and Tarkowski out of out of Burnley. They're much better than him as well. There, there is no, you know, he he shouldn't be near an England squad, but um, he is because the manager loves him because he plays for Manchester United. You know, end of argument. Did anybody in that those two games actually impress you or make you think, oh, they should get more game time? Because in the San Marino game, he did play some, I suppose, fringe players. And with the Euros coming up, why is he doing that? The, the question you have to start with is, why against a team as bad as Albania did he play two holding midfielders? So he essentially had six a defence of six players, plus the goalkeeper, against a team that are not going to attack you. And the, the reason is, he, he appears to have decided, following France's example at the last World Cup, that the way you win these tournaments is just become incredibly difficult to score against and hope that up front the strikers sort something out for you. And that seems to be his, his plan. So if he has that as a plan, he has to follow it through. So everybody who plays has to play to the same pattern. So it doesn't matter whether it's a good team or a bad team, you play the same pattern. Everyone understands the pattern. Anyone can come in and just slot into the, the position. I think that's what he's doing. I, I don't agree with it at all. I think I'd much rather follow position in 1970 than France a few years ago who were a very poor team to win a World Cup um, but win it they did by being incredibly difficult to score against and having the referee on your side making decisions that help you but Southgate can't guarantee that I suppose well no I see what you mean about you know copying France or taking note of just in the, the same sort of way I suppose Woolwich won the league being incredibly boring and difficult to beat and nicking 1-0 victories the same with Portugal and Greece in the last what 20 years I suppose dreadful to watch and England against Albania job done 2-0 but it was it was tough to watch, wasn't it? Yeah, the the highlight moment the highlight moment was Kane's header because everyone is has been going on about what a great cross. It was, actually, it was a very bad cross. It was behind him, and it was his movement that created the chance. He actually came back away from the goal and got enough power on the header to to knock it in. The cross itself was actually not very good. Um, so I think all the all the writers who wrote about what a great cross really ought to look at it again. Kane made that goal, and it was a very very good goal. Yes, he did. He moved his body in such a way that he actually got to the ball, which was a poor ball, really. But it was one of the few crosses we got into the box. And again, something I don't understand is we don't seem to have people who can take free kicks and, well, dead ball situations like corners. Yeah, they, they weren't good, were they? Very, very poor. But the worst, the worst moment in the match was when the ball came down for Sterling, two yards away from the goal, swung and completely missed the ball. And you think, well, what on earth is he doing on a football pitch? He's a good player, but that was a moment that he will want to forget. Yeah, I mean, Raheem Sterling is on that list with Aguero as some of the all-time top scorers for Man City. So he's got something, and you can understand, looking at the rest of them, why he's in the England squad. Were there any? Was there anybody missing from that from that squad that should have been there? Um, on form, no. But uh, the play, you know, there are players missing through injury that should be there. Grealish, Madison, and uh, Jaden Sancho. Obviously, Jaden Sancho should be the first name on the team sheet. You know, a player who scored scored as many goals as Sterling last year and had as many assists as De Bruyne all in one player and he's making uh, Haaland look fantastic at Borussia Dortmund but he's injured Madison and Grealish should be in the in the squad I'd argue they should be in the team um, but again Southgate doesn't like creative players he'd much rather throw in an extra defender yes yeah, Sancho of course injured so we can understand why he's not there the rest of them I suppose on their, they're on merits fair enough given the choice Mason Mount um, scored a great goal uh, the second goal against Albania and the case being made that somehow he's pretty Progressed under Tuchel uh, was, and was being held back a bit by Lampard, but he, he's he's there on merit, I suppose. Oh, oh, definitely, he's there on merit. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't agree with if anyone says he was being held back by Lampard. Lampard started him in nearly every game, I think, and he, Lampard had him at Derby County as well on loan, didn't he? So no, he wasn't being held back. I think what's helping him with Tuchel is there's more structure to the attacking play, and he understands what he's got to do basically, and which is the strength that Tuchel has. Everybody understands what they have to do. All right, so we're under-impressed with Southgate's tactics, 
but we don't think, given the injuries, we don't think he picked a, a bad squad, apart from possibly Maguire and Dyer, Tottenham's Eric Dyer, who uh, shouldn't be in the squad either. Well, Dyer shouldn't be in the Tottenham team or even the Tottenham squad, should he? He's been absolutely shocking. I mean, he's, he's been as bad as Maguire in the last last year and a half. Yeah, I mean, as a Tottenham fan, I'm, I, they are talking of having a massive clear-out at Tottenham and there's a possibility that up to 10 players could be uh, offloaded in the summer on a kind to hope he's one of them yeah hope hope is what kills you isn't it the, the problem for any team that's looking to restructure on that sort of scale is who's got the money to buy the players no premier league team has got any money which is one argument that some people are using to say harry kane won't go anywhere although if he is going to leave this is the the end end of season time that he will I think. Going back to San Marino and to Albania, I suppose, uh, with all due respect, Gary Lineker tweeted, I think it was after the San Marino game, that he was, he thinks it is pointless teams of San Marino's level playing teams of England's level. They've never won a competitive match at all. He suggested that they, much like the Nations League, should play against themselves, the lower teams, and then move up to play teams like England, Portugal, etc. Yeah, he's 100% right. And I thought that's what the Nations League was all about. Out. So all they need to do is form, formalise it so that these, you know, the, the winner of the teams in the Nations League Division Three do play in the in the qualifiers. But below that, all you do is you you get up to that, and that's that's the prize you get for winning it. The, it's utterly pointless. I mean, how many of these? We're going to have hundreds of matches in this qualifying round that are completely and utterly pointless. And I I cannot see what good it does the teams taking part. What good does it do San Marino to be hammered? You know, on average five. Neil every time they go out can't help them in any way at all no they're not they're not going to develop as a footballing nation if all they're doing is defending and picking the ball out the back of the net and it certainly doesn't give them the opportunity to I don't know build a fan base in their own country who'd go see their national team lose every week and also it doesn't give players the I don't know the impetus to want to become a footballer for their nation so I think Gary Lineker's onto something maybe they should be playing amongst themselves and at the end of each round or whatever they then go into some sort of playoffs against the third place team or the second place team in the the groups with England yeah that would be a, a, a much more sensible way to carry on I think yeah I mean in England's group you've got San Marino, Andorra, and Albania, who I suppose to a lesser extent, but still a lower-ranked footballing nation. So those three teams, no, they're not going to qualify. They've got Poland, England, and Hungary against them, and two qualifying places. So those three teams immediately know, as soon as the draw's made, that they're out of the World Cup. Yeah, it's it's utterly pointless. I, uh, I don't understand why they do it the way they do, but they do. So here we are, and let, let's just hope something more sensible can come out of it. However, however, one of those lower-ranked nations, as we like to look at them, if you get drawn against them, uh, you think, oh, that's 3-4-5-0, is Luxembourg. And yet, Jeff, they beat the Republic of Ireland away, and everybody was shocked. Everybody is shocked, and the, the press are, are running a campaign to get Stephen Kenny fired as the, as the manager. And not my job to, um, to work on behalf of Stephen Kenny. He has an agent to do that for him. But uh, something that people seem to be either ignoring or, or don't know is that the players in the Luxembourg team on average play in leagues above the players in the Republic of Ireland team. The better team won. The team with the better players won. Why Why you would expect Republic of Ireland to beat Luxembourg is, is a mystery because Luxembourg are a better team. Yeah, I suppose Luxembourg was one of those that you used to beat 7-0 years and years ago and they have, despite being drawn against the bigger teams all the time, somehow then developed. Yeah, they, they have and and their players are playing they're not all playing in the Bundesliga or the French League Ligue 1 but they're in the second division of those which is a much higher level than the Republic of Ireland players um, the Republic of Ireland are one of those teams that um, only had two matches two full qualifying matches so they decided to add in a friendly against Qatar and m- maybe I, I cannot understand why you would do that because without paying customers where's the financial incentive for it they'd be much better off having a rest and doing training I would have thought but they're going to play Qatar and if anyone thinks they they should beat Qatar please remember that Qatar beat Luxembourg recently so (laughs) it may well not be the the morale booster that the Irish FA were hoping for No, another pointless friendly though Wales played Mexico I think yesterday or something and what was the point of that? Practice, I get it but in these times when you haven't got the spectators there as you say and these times when you're not supposed to travel and all these stupid I mean a couple of Wales players got kicked out for breaching protocol why make it more complicated 
just get it over with. England have got Poland coming up. By the time this podcast goes out, they'll be playing. It is tomorrow. That's actually going to be a proper test. Well, yeah, but the test is going to be much easier for England because Lewandowski is out injured, injured in that first first match for Poland. Uh, although he's uh, he scored twice, um, so not having the best centre forward in the world playing against you is a, a big plus. He he's not going to embarrass uh, Maguire this time, but. <laughs> But probably somebody else will. Oh, I'm sure Maguire will embarrass himself. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, we don't have to face the, the, the best centre forward in the world. Uh, hopefully we'll be playing with the second best centre forward in the world, Harry Kane. So we might have a chance in that one. That's a proper tie. But the others, we think probably yeah, they should play amongst themselves and develop as much as Luxembourg somehow has. But Luxembourg, again, it is surrounded by countries with big leagues. And maybe they've done what you suggested San Marino should do. Uh, possibly. I, I, I don't know. Um, but they've definitely improved over the last 10 years as a team. Their results are much better. Their players are playing in better leagues in Europe. So, yeah, fair play play to them they've, they've done well so just to take it back to uh, to Ireland for a minute the reason the the press was so anti Stephen Kenny is is basically his record although he was a fantastic manager and incredibly successful with Ireland's under 21s his record uh, with the full t- full team is played 10 one nil so there is a lot of um, a lot of pressure for the Irish FA to fire him but considering the Horlicks they made of hiring him in the first place and the you know, members of the Irish FA committee being being sacked, having their collar felt by the uh, by the Irish police, etc. Maybe he he's got enough. He has enough time to turn things around. Strangely, and for me, I don't understand it. One thing they don't have in these international games, they are qualifiers for a World Cup. It doesn't get bigger than that. They don't have VAR, and there were a couple of incidents during this international break that where you think really they should have had it but there are some people who are suggesting rather extreme changes to the rules yeah Marco van Basten came out at the weekend with a comment saying you know the one way to get rid of the controversy with VAR over offside is get rid of the offside law completely just scrap it and I must admit I agree with him because everyone goes oh no you know and they'll quote the reasons why the offside law was introduced in the first place to stop attackers goal hanging well so what if they goal hang it's now now up to you as a defence, do you do you mark him, man mark him, go with him, or leave him? It will just become forgotten and just become part of the game that, yeah, somebody does push up. What will happen is it will stretch the game. So the instead of the pitch being constantly one third of the length of the pitch because one team presses and the other attacks into a small area, it will now stretch it and there'll be more space and more entertaining football. I'm 100% in favour of it. I think it's a great idea by Van Basten. I, I like your argument. I'm not sure. I do agree that, yeah, it'll be, if they did it in years to come, some people will have forgotten about it and it won't be controversial. Much like, I suppose, the pass back to the goalkeeper. He can no longer pick it up. He has to use his feet. Not quite as controversial, but people were going, what? You can't do that. That's a big change. You don't notice it anymore. However, don't you think it'll mean that you'll have one goal hanger at each end and then um, defenders or, go- or or the opposition goalkeeper punting it up to him in the box and just have the ball flinging, you know, like tennis, one end to the other? It's possible, but so what? Um, you know, the, from the second the goalkeeper puts the ball back into play, it is in play. So it's up to you as the opposition to do something about it. But there'll be more room, more space on the pitch for you, for your creative players. It will be harder to defend, definitely. But so what? That's what we have bright minds, in, you know, as managers for, isn't it? To solve problems like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I just envisaging that ball being flung, you know, straight to the goal hanger, as you called him, or just completely packed defences. And one of the things that, for me, about the offside rule that kind of makes football exciting is watching that perfectly timed pass and run through the defence. One player passes it through the defence, and the other one beats the offside trap and runs through. That, for me, is part of the excitement of of some of the attacking football that we watch. Yeah, and I. I I don't see why it would necessarily change. It may, may well be that teams don't put up a goal hanger. I mean, they, they don't have to, it, but you get a choice. You can do it. It doesn't hurt, you know, basketball doesn't have an offside law. It doesn't hurt that. It doesn't it? I don't know. <laughs> that would be really difficult to judge, I think, with the size of the... the relative size of the pitch I suppose uh, and the speed of the game but I'd, I'm not sure about that I, I'd, I think it needs a change though VAR certainly needs shaking up there's nothing wrong with the technology it's the humans behind it and all those lines to dis- decide whether his hip is offside or his quiff or his toe something there has to change yeah and and I think it's very very simple and it's it's a solution that's used in in athletics the, the argument is that they're saying if any part of your body that can score a goal is offside well 
if you look at how players, two players running together, a defender and an attacker, at, uh, at each sort of millisecond, one of them will have their legs ahead of the other, but they'll be running, they'll be running side by side. So n- no one is ahead. But in that split millisecond, they say, oh no, the, the, the attacker's knee was ahead. No, go to what athletics do. It's not whose knee or arm or anything that crosses the line first. It's their body. Your body is you. So they can easily just, just change the law to say it's your body, your chest. If your chest is ahead of the other player then you are ahead of him not your head not your arms not your legs it's your body that's the only time when you are ahead of the other player I do agree with that because often you'll see an offside ruling and they'll say, oh, his knee or foot is further ahead. But that's because he's, his stride is out. They're not, they're not striding together. It's not synchronised running. So that his foot is, or some, one of the two person's feet are going to be ahead at one point. Yeah, and one nanosecond later, the defender's leg is ahead. They are running side by side. Nobody is ahead. And yet they're ruling somebody offside. It's crazy. It, it's insanity. Just change the law to say it's you, your chest. Whoever's chest is further ahead is actually ahead. I mean, I don't know why it suddenly became so controversial or such a point of discussion. Because years ago, you, I mean, sometimes you'd shout at the lines person or the assistant referee, as they're called now, you know, you, but what you're doing is not definitely not offside. But because they didn't review every offside, and certainly offsides weren't part of replays as much as they, as they are now, we sort of let it go. But now the spotlight is on it. We're noticing mistakes more. Perhaps they were always there, but just weren't, weren't highlighted. Oh, the, the mistakes were always there before and according to the the laws as they are now written and the rules that say how you implement it the the correct decisions are being made but it's ruining football if we don't go with Marco van Basten I don't think anybody's going to do that there has to be something in between what we've got now and what the radical change he's suggesting you can't go back and stop VAR so because it's technology and you want it people wanted accuracy well you've got it you can look at the different screens it does make me worry though that what we watch at home and watch what match of the day like Gary Lineker and everybody watch on their big screens how come we can all see it and yet the VAR people can't and surely they have more angles yeah but you then get into certainly in the in England who runs refereeing and f- for what reason do they do it and if you can answer those two questions there, well, there is your answer and it is money yeah possibly yeah, that's for another discussion but Marco Van Basten with something very radical there I think you're right and he's wrong don't tell him but <laughs> I think yeah the chest because at least everybody's chest is at the same level it's like the centre of gravity or it's always equal no matter what, what whether you're running or, or jogging or whatever well the international break finishes this week uh, midweek and then on Saturday we start the Premier League again so time for our traditional prediction of the scores uh, an easy one to start with Jeff Chelsea against West Brom um, well, it's pick a number and I choose number three and it will be a 3-0 Chelsea win yeah you pick the number three for Chelsea I'll pick the number nil for West Brom then uh, that is 3-0 to Chelsea Leeds United against a Sheffield United bit of a local Yorkshire derby there and Sheffield United have got to start winning some games I think that might be a draw though I'll go for 2-1 2-1 Leeds win uh, next we've got a top three battle two teams who well, particularly Leicester consistent all season Leicester City against Manchester so we've had Leeds United against Sheffield United Leicester City against Manchester City a tailor two cities I'm going to go for Leicester 1 Man City 2 yeah I, th- I think that's probably right but just to give a different number I'll go Leicester 1 Man City 3 so <laughs> we, we both know that Man City are going to win that uh, and then here's one uh, interesting one Really, as a Tottenham fan, I'd like to see both teams lose this game. It is Woolwich Wanderers against Liverpool. 2-0 to Liverpool. The Wanderers get nothing. That's a sentence I could hear every day. Uh, Sunday sees uh, four games. Southampton against Burnley. That could be interesting. I'm going to go for a 2-1 away win for Burnley. And I'll go for uh, a one all draw. Then we've got the Jongleurs against Tottenham. Yeah, the comedy club against the boring club. Let's go for a 1-1 draw. Say say the genius that is Steve Bruce has managed to get the junglers into some sort of shape that doesn't involve playing Gale, who's a centre forward, as a left wing, and Fraser, who's a left winger as, and five foot four, as a centre forward. The genius of Bruce will produce something, a surprising draw. And I'm going to say uh, that Newcastle haven't got it in them gore, and I think Tottenham will come away 2-0. 
winners. With Dyer in defence, are you sure? All right, 2-1. Uh, then we've got two games that both, on paper at least, sound like they'd be fun to watch. Uh, good football matches to watch as a neutral. Aston Villa against Fulham is the first one. 2-1 uh, Villa. Yeah, I think that's probably all right. I agree with that one. Manchester United against Brighton. Now, that should be an attractive game, given the wealth of talent Man United have and the beautiful way Brighton play. Yeah, but that, that squad that cost a billion pounds ought to be much too strong for, for Brighton. 3-1 to Manchester United. Yeah, probably, given, as you say, the billion pounds worth of players on the pitch. Everton against Crystal Palace on Monday. Oh, I think this is a draw. 1-1 one, one draw. And then finally, your team, West Ham, are away at Wolverhampton Wanderers. Oh, that really could be anything, couldn't it? But I will say Hammers win 2-1. I think that's going to be a draw. All right, that's all we've got time for, apart from the question and answer to your rather fascinating trivia question. Okay, the, the question was, what have Matt Sadler, Frank Gill, Mark Robbins, Wayne Gill and Ishmael Miller got in common? And what they have in common is that they have all scored against teams whose nickname is the same as their surname. Matt Sadler scored against Walsall, who are the Sadlers. Frank Gill and Wayne Gill both scored against the Gills in Gillingham. Wayne Gill got one for Tranmere, and the Frank Gill goal was also for Tranmere against Gillingham. It was quite a coincidence, yeah. Matt Sadler, who scored against the Sadlers, now plays for them. So Sadler plays for the Sadlers. And Mar- Mark Robbins in 2003 scored two against two different teams, Cheltenham, who are known as the Robbins, and Swindon, who are known as the Robbins. Ishmael Miller scored for Huddersfield against Rotherham, who are the Millers. So that's what they have in common. But there's a lovely sort of synergy and synchronicity about all all that beautiful that's all we've got time for we we will be back next week with more football fun news and gossip i'm chris carl and i'm jeff saunders and that was hitting the bar the football podcast <laughs>